So I intro this video with two quick things. The first is I know the video's long. I know there's people out there that talk about you gotta get people quick because they have short attention spans and Instagram and YouTube and internet has changed the culture. The truth is what we're trying to do as a culture and a brand is probably not going to be a fit for people that think like that. So if you are somebody that doesn't want to sit down and try to digest long form content, we're probably not the brand for you no matter how well we can coach people or how well we line up as an organization for what you're looking for, it's just probably not gonna work long term. Second, um, I thought it would be practical and helpful because I'm assuming a lot of people watching this either are avid readers themselves so they wanna kinda get an insight into the books that I'm reading to know if they wanna read them themselves or you don't have the time or the capacity to actually read yourself, so you wanna be able to extract some of the information from books that I've read. And something that I have found is valuable with reading in general is not to think of it as a completion thing. Like I don't need to get into the book and read it from cover to cover as fast as possible. That same principle applies to this video content. When I digest podcasts, when I listen to audio, or when I listen to something on a regular basis, if I get 10 minutes in the day, I'll listen to it for 10 minutes, I'll pause it at a point that makes sense, and I'll come back to it when I get time. You don't need to make time in your day to listen to this video from, from start to finish all the way through every time you sit down and digest content. You should get comfortable being able to split things up and digest them within the course of your day. So hopefully that gives you a, you know, a reason to look at this however long this video is and, and not have that be an excuse not to invest in your own education because there is a way to just slowly digest the content the same way that I don't read a book cover to cover in one night. I'll read a couple pages, go back to it the next day, and over time, figure out a way to get to the outcome that you're looking for, which is completion. We had a client come into town to train and he gave me this book as a gift. It's called Good Profit. It's by Charles Koch. Uh, I don't know the exact value, but Charles Koch is worth some number over $50 billion. Uh, he's one of the wealthiest men in the world. And I thought it would be cool to A, read the book since it was a gift. And then as I was reading it, I was thinking that the parallels of success in training and business are actually very similar. And I think a lot of times in the current market, there are people that are promoting quote unquote business ideas that are um, short-sighted that won't create long-term value for people and I think that same thing happens in the world of fitness uh, did I say fitness or business in both business and fitness that happens where people give advice and push and promote ideas that don't last and don't create long-term development so I'm gonna go through a series of quotes some of those quotes tie into business and training think tank and training think tanks philosophies in terms of how I'm trying to create a long-term business. And some of them go into the development of physical capacities. And I just thought that that would be a, an interesting thing to discuss and illustrate taking principles of success from somebody that has nothing to do with physical development and has to do with business development and show how those parallels uh, play out in both realms. But MBM, MBM from now on, as I uh, reference it, is their market-based management framework, which is a trademarked term that they use. So if I use that in the quotes from now on, you know what it means. All right, back to the quote. But MBM is not a secret sauce recipe. It can't be relayed in a list of to-dos, nor is it a package of thinking outside the box slogans that can be implemented after a day-long seminar. I just like that because there are a ton of people out there that are you know, famous on Instagram or on social media platforms and their entire strategies for motivating and pushing people and giving people takeaways are one sentence quotes or slogans. And I don't really think that you ever create a level of expertise and a level of long-term development that is that simple. Now, 
at some point of development, you can take your complexity and simplify it into those principles. But the truth is, I think if we're constantly telling people that don't know, so if somebody wants to be a games athlete and they don't know what is required to be a games athlete, and I simplify that down to some slogan like, okay, it's just about hard work and suffering better than other people, then those people, without knowing that there was a requisite level of movement quality, a requisite level of skills and all the skills that are required, a requisite level of sleep that's required, a requisite level of time that's required to dedicate to the craft, a requisite level of sleep that's dedicated to the craft, they lose sight of all of those other important variables that are going to dictate long-term success. So I just like that the principles of business for developing a multi-billion dollar global business are not something that can be put into a quick do-it-like-this narrative. Next quote, the successful application of MBM requires internalizing its principles at all levels of the organization, especially in leadership. If you've never swing a golf club or driven a car before, theory and instruction will only get you so far. You need to pick up a club or get behind the wheel and keep practicing until you internalize the mechanics to the point where you can do so automatically. This is a principle I think I've, I've had a really difficult time as I've been going through a quest of uh, coaching athletes and moving and being an athlete in my past. People come to you when you start to stand on a pedestal of quote unquote success that other people perceive you on and they ask you, how do you do what you do? Or um, what is it that makes this person move better? How do I coach? How do I program? And the truth is, uh, this has been a big struggle for us to create organizational principles or educational principles in our educational courses online because people want to have to be told exactly what to do. And I don't think that true teaching happens like that or true learning happens like that. I think the first thing that you can do is give somebody a framework with which to look at the problem. And then the true learning happens in the continued application and mistake making process after you have a good starting framework to work off of. And I think there are a lot of people that, you know, they go through academic institutions to so go to school for exercise physiology, they want to be a coach, they learn all of this theoretical stuff, theory on sports psychology, theory on uh, biomechanics, theory on getting people better at energy system work. And then they quote unquote think they know how to help people or how to do it themselves. But the real world application of doing things and dealing with people and dealing with their emotions and moving and understanding how the body moves and changes as a singular unit is something that you really can't model because there are an infinite number of variables that go into each person's unique human life experience. So uh, the, the discussion that true understanding or true wisdom is something that you can only really develop by putting in the work is just a, um, again, it's just something that really resonated with how I think. Next quote. Second, we built an organization that would provide superior service to our customers. From my work with Arthur D. Little and all my studies, I had a clear understanding that the purpose of business was to create value for customers. I had read enough business literature to know that if you couldn't satisfy your customers, you had no business. In the, this ties a lot to the fitness space businesses that I see out there. Um, I actually went to school for business, so I had a different context with which how I wanted to build my business long term than I think a lot of people in the market and where they get their information from right now to build their businesses and fitness. But it seems that a lot of people measure business success by purely looking at revenue numbers. So gross revenue or their net takeaway at the end of the year or total number of people that they have signed up for a specific product or a specific group or a specific um, seminar or something that they teach on a regular basis. And while that marketing aspect of business and getting people in the door and getting consumers to sign up is an important thing, if you're not delivering in those 
things where people are paying you money for. You're never going to have long-term customer retention. And I think a lot of businesses in fitness right now are more concerned about looking successful. So having expensive things, uh, promoting themselves and, you know, taking pictures or videos of them doing things that are impressive that other people strive for and not actually focused on the most important thing in business that is if somebody's paying you money as a customer, they're, you know, let's say they're giving you $10. In return for that $10, you need to provide value that either matches or exceeds that value that they place on that $10. And that's a hard thing to continually do with people over and over and over again. And it's something that we constantly strive to figure out, okay, how can we make this experience better for our remote athletes? How can we get new people in the door? How can we create new products? When we do create new products, how can we make sure that they have value that exceeds what the market's going to be paying for it? How do we price our products relative to where the market is? How do we compare our products relative to where the market is? I think that's something people need to really be thinking about if they hope to have a career in fitness because fitness, if you haven't noticed at this point or you haven't been around for a really long time in fitness, is a very transient culture. Things come into popularity. So like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, macros and bodybuilding nutrition was like the thing that everything, everyone was talking about with regards to nutritional coaching. And then it came out of favor. No one talked about weighing and measuring. It was about food quality. It was about paleo nutrition. It was about anti-sugar. It was about, um, zone dieting and portion control and and then it circled back and now macros are like the thing again. So if we know that there's a cyclical and rhythmic nature to what is in po- what's popular in the market at any period of time, you need to find something that runs through that narrative no matter what's popular at any given moment and the truth is that's people. All people no matter what's popular and what's in, you know, in in popular at that point in time, the people that you have that are your customers are, are the are the thread that runs through the narrative of your entire business. So it's something that I think people need to really think about is people, the people outside of your organization that are paying you money. You got to think about what their experience is like inside your organization. And it's not something that's easy to do. It's something that, you know, we probably let people down all the time, but we're just some striving to ensure that we're making a difference in their life relative to the amount of money they're paying us to do so. We focused on increasing the rate of growth of our crude oil gathering business, usually reinvesting 90% of the profits as Coke Industries does now. This is a purely business quote that I pulled up. Uh, Another thing that I see in the market with people, you know, they reach out to me, they want to talk about their businesses and their business infrastructure. And I, you know, I ask I don't ask directly, I just kind of ask questions about how they operate and what they do and what their lifestyle choices are like. And you find that businesses that really aren't making that much money, the owners of those businesses are taking that money out, putting it in their pocket, investing in their 401ks, investing it in the stock market, buying cars, buying houses. And if you want to build a long-term business, it's a really important thing to take the money that you're making and reinvest it into the business, which is a reflection that you believe in what you're building and that you believe that you can outperform whatever market returns that you could get outside. And I thought it was a really interesting and cool thing to see a company that's that massive, that these people are worth billions of dollars. They literally never need to work a day in their lives Um, probably from the time, probably for the last 30 years, they didn't have to work and they still reinvest 90% of their profits. And that's just a really cool thing to see that they believe so much that they can outperform the market and their primary investment is back in their own culture. Next quote. I mentioned earlier, there have been plenty of errors in our trial and error approach. A good trial and error approach would test the validity of such a large scale venture before plunging headfirst. The size of the experiment should have been limited in proportion to the risk adjusted potential of the opportunity. So this is a cool one that runs the narrative or runs both narratives of business development and uh, physical development. I see a lot of people in the CrossFit culture, in the fitness culture, 
doing workouts that I look at and I just constantly ask, what's the purpose of this relative to your training goals? And sometimes people's response are like, I just wanted a good challenge. And I'm all for that. I think mental and physical challenges and making sure your physical body can take really difficult things is a is a really important aspect of making yourself a strong human body and human mind and developing emotional capacity to deal with frustrations of life. However, the risk a lot of people I, are taking, the way that I see it, the way I see them do the workouts and the way I see them select what they're doing is silly because the the challenge that they can find or the challenge that they want can be found with much less risk in their actual training. And I see that same thing happen with games athletes. We don't really know what we're training for. We don't really know what they're gonna have to do at any given you know, moment in time on the competition floor. So people's thought are, well, this could happen at the game, so I'm gonna justify doing it. Yeah, but if that's potentially going to hurt you or potentially run your hormones into a position that you can no longer train, then it's obviously not worth, the reward of being quote unquote mentally tougher is not worth the risk of ruining your body and ruining the thing that allows you to compete as an athlete. So that's the, um, the athletic side of it, that people should be evaluating the risk reward of any training session and making sure that that makes sense. I think good training is getting the maximal reward to the least amount of risk. And we have to take more risks with higher level athletes, but beginner level athletes probably don't really need to take that much risk in their training to get reward because training adaptation comes much easier to them. Then on the business side, I see a lot of, um, I guess box owners or people that are affiliate owners or people who have small personal training studios, they, they develop a successful and profitable business model on a current amount of uh, fixed expenses. So they have a, whatever, a, a 3,000 square foot unit, this amount of coaches, they fill up, they realize that they're at capacity and they need more space. And instead of thinking about, okay, is this increase in space, how much is it gonna cost me monthly to, to what's my overhead gonna be on it? What's the amount of new clients we need to bring in to be able to be at the same profit level in this new space? How many new coaches do I need to service this? How much more uh, service in general am I gonna need to make sure that it's clean and the areas are landscaped and that I'm you know, buying and, and inventorying shirts and uh, drinks and all of the things that need to be there to support a business. And then looking at what that profit and loss estimated would look like on the new investment. Instead, they just make the decision impulsively. And instead of saying, hey, we're gonna operate within this space and we're just gonna keep making sure that it's a more efficient, tight business and I'm gonna just stay within my lane and make this awesome, they think bigger is better. And I think going through risk analysis and figuring out how to, like how much risk am I putting down in this investment and what do I get out of it and having some sort of an analytical approach to that is something that's necessary if you want to have a business that runs long term. So again, the parallels of running a business and developing somebody's physical capacity actually um, are very similar. The point is that progress comes through experimentation and failure. Those who favor a grand plan over experimentation fail to understand the role that failed experiments play in creating progress in society. Failures quickly and efficiently signal what doesn't work, minimizing waste and redirecting scarce resources to what does work. Again, this, this one, the parallels between business and training are there, but I'm gonna talk specifically about training. I think as we've gotten more popular and as we put more content out and as I get more questions, people think that I, that I'm going to be able to give them answers. And the truth is, I don't think I ever have had answers. I don't think that the more information and the more experience I gain that I get better answers. I potentially make better guesses and I'm able to recorrect after failures quicker and understand which methods are going to potentially work better for that specific athlete in that specific moment in time. There 
is no perfect periodization scheme. There is no perfect method to become a better coach. There is no perfect cue you can give an athlete to make sure they move well. There is no perfect training organization that can ensure that their athletes are going to be able to maintain quality movement when they're at maximal levels of fatigue. And the truth is that we run experiments on athletes and we continually look at things as like, okay, well, that didn't work. So I need to figure out how to make sure that it works moving forward. And people seem to be very scared of failure. And I think that holds a lot of people back. Any champion ever developed on this planet went through a series of losses to be able to get to the point that they were finally a champion. They were young and they went up to you know higher age groups and challenged themselves when they were there they got beat by their coaches as they were growing up and phenoms probably get to the point where they're losing less frequently early in their careers but the truth is everyone at some point has to be accustomed or has to get accustomed to losing and figuring out okay when i lose how do i deal with this how do i cope with the experience how do i move forward and how do i actually make progress after I made a mistake. So it's cool to see, again, a company that's had this much success that guys worth $100 billion or something astronomical is able to honestly say that he's made so many failures and that failure is a important part of the process of business development. Next, I'm a bona fide book person. My home contains more books than I'll ever have time to count, and the walls of my Wichita office are lined with them too. So this one was just funny. I, I, I actually stopped writing blogs because we got feedback that people nowadays don't read. I mean, we had pretty good readership in our blog, but um, the volume of, of viewers on video content is just way higher. And people all the time, they, they want an answer. They want... Uh, you know, they want us to create a product that has all of the information of all the books that all of our coaches have ever read into one cohesive narrative that makes everything make sense. But people that are really successful read all the time. And that's why I started reading because I noticed like all these people that have awesome businesses and that are put on the top of society read all the time. So I want to read more because I struggle to read and so that's the process that kind of started me down the path of reading and it's something that i have seen as a big weakness in the world of fitness that people talk about intelligent people all the time like somebody becomes intelligent in the market and they put them up on a pedestal and they look up to them but they don't do any of the shit that that person had did to get there in the first place and reading is one of the most important aspects of most of those people's success and that's in business that's in understanding training that's for athletes understanding mind state uh competition performance cues, uh, understanding how to deal with adversity. There's just so much that can be learned by reading other people's thoughts. And it's something I think people need to get more comfortable doing on a regular basis. Successful companies struggle to keep up because given human nature, we all tend to become complacent, self-protective, and less innovative as we succeed. It can be far more difficult to overcome success than adversity. And that's just something I wanted to put up specifically for athletes or people in general. I found that, you know, with body composition people, once somebody feels lean, right, they go through this weight loss process because weight loss is something that is put up on a pedestal in society. So they get lean and then all of the behaviors that they had to get them to that point, once they feel successful or okay with how they look, stop and they go through this cyclical period of improving and regressing and improving and regressing and improving and regressing and they're not able to stay on a linear path of progress for long periods of time athletes get to a high level they get to the you know the pinnacle of sport and then because they've gotten money and fame and attention and positive encouragement about what they've done they stop doing what it is that got them there in the first place. I think if you want to live a, a successful life or elongate the period of success in whatever discipline you're doing at any period of time, 
there needs to be something about what you're doing on a day-to-day basis that you really enjoy doing. And the things that you enjoy doing have to lead to progress, not just be obsessed with winning or making money or whatever positive outcome you're looking for, but instead be more process-oriented about what it is that you're doing and continue to do those things until you no longer like to do them. Then maybe sit down and go through a process of self, self-inquiry and figure out, okay, is, there, is this just my time now to move on and do something else? Palanyi, I think that's a guy's name, Palanyi argued that we only truly know something, that is, have a personal knowledge of it, when we can apply it to get results. So that ties into some another quote that I said earlier. I think there are a lot of people out there that... Um, want to turn themselves into gurus and say like, oh, I can help you do this or I can help you grow a business or come to my seminar and I'll teach you how to do this. And until that person proves that they can with consistency help apply those things that they're teaching to actually get results, I look at them as just being full of shit. And I'm kind of in the same boat as I always think I'm full of shit. I always am trying to make sure that I'm backing up everything that I'm saying with actual empirical results and saying like, okay, this has worked. I, you know, it's worked with this athletes, it worked with these athletes, it's not working with this demographic. Why might it not be working with this demographic? How do we change it? And going through that process has allowed me to feel like, oh, okay, now I kind of understand all of the thousands of pages of training literature and training research and and what those things mean and how to apply them and who to apply them to and where they're not ap- applicable anymore so that's a just a quote that really resonates with me that um n- while information might be cheap in the market right now uh just because of the internet and how efficient google is and how regularly people put information out there True knowledge is just something that still takes a long time to acquire and it's still a relatively rare attribute that you see in people. Short-term profits, while necessary, are not sufficient for long-term business success. Each business must take to heart what Schumpter called capitalism's essential role, driving the perennial gale of creative destruction. To succeed in the long term, a business must innovate and improve as at least as as fast as its most effective competitor. That is true in business and that's improve, true in, in sport as athletes. It doesn't matter how much better you get from year to year. It matters more how much better you get relative to the field of competitors you're competing against as athletes. And I know there are coaches out there, myself included, that talk about only being able to work on the things that you can control and improving what you can do from year to year. But the truth is, your expectations and your happiness and your reason for doing things are based on how you're going to perform in a competition. And in that competition, there are going to be a ton of other people that have gotten better. So watching them, observing them, collecting data from them, having other training partners that are close to your level so you can observe the level of improvement and progress from year to year to ensure that you're getting better relative to the field is an important thing. And in business, you know, a business must innovate and improve at least as fast as its most effective competitor. That's just something that people need to take into consideration is that the market's resources, the amount of people that are out there that can be your customers is a scarce and finite number. And in order to improve and get your business better, you need to be an attractive Uh, option or alternative for them. So you have to be aware of what other people around are doing and you have to be able to innovate faster than them and more efficiently than them. If you're copying what other people are doing and you're not actually innovating and working on your own stuff, that is probably not going to lead itself or lend itself to long-term success. Doubling our earnings in six years requires that we continually improve our ability to 
more fully and broadly apply MBM, that we add and develop the talent to function effectively as a much larger, larger and more complex company. So this is something that I've talked about with people for a really long period of time is that I've strived to have linear growth rates in my company. And I think we've been able to grow at 40% annually year over year since inception. And a lot of people that I've talked to talk about that being slow in the fitness market. And it was just a really cool thing, something that made me feel really good to know that somebody that's worth billions and billions of dollars that I would quote unquote look up to as a business mentor, not somebody that, you know, has a YouTube channel that, you know, doesn't really actually run a business that does anything like my business does, giving me advice talks about just trying to double profits over a six year period. And that's a really, really incredible thing to do at a business this size, but that's been his primary goal since starting the company. So it's a cool thing to see. And I think if people aim to do that same thing in fitness, instead of trying to hit dramatic back squat PRs over the course of a 12 week aggressive squat cycle, if they tried to just add some percentage to their squat every six months and continually to get incremental gains on that squat over and over and over again for three to five five years, I think they'd probably be more likely to succeed over the long term. Based on its vision, Coke develops and implements strategies that will maximize long-term value. We can only do so if we set priorities. In a complex business, deciding the order in which to do things can be just as important as deciding what things to do. And when setting priorities, one of the most difficult choices is between short-term optimization strategies and long-term growth and innovation strategies. This is purely a training thing I was thinking about with regards to uh, competing in the sport of CrossFit. If somebody says you gotta get better at everything, If you're distributing all of your training adaptation currency to all the things that you need to get better at, and let's say there's a hundred things, you might get half a percent better at every one of those things and not actually statistically improve the things that you really need to improve to succeed. So it's an important thing to be able to analyze and look at the needs of yourself as an athlete and be able to prioritize the things that are most important at any given period of time and put more of your attentional focus resources on those things. Spending too much time looking at too many variables, I think, paralyzes people because they're overanalyzing everything, because they're constantly trying to find a competitive edge in all things. And in trying to find a competitive edge in all things, you really find a competitive edge in no things. So um, that, that was what resonated with me there as I was thinking about how this applies to training people. No one is born with the right values, myself included. I had to learn the principles that are important for success in business and how they are best articulated and applied. Everyone in business and in every position within a company can be constantly learning and strengthening the values that drive success. Again, this one for me tied back to training and performance. I hear so many people talk about the high level athletes that I coach and they're like, oh, well, I'm not like them. I'm just a regular person. And the truth is when I met Travis, he was, kind of a regular person in a lot of the physical things that were required for the sport. He definitely had some physical gifts, but I don't think that I would have looked at him or anybody would have looked at him and said, okay, this is gonna be a four-time games athlete who finishes as high as 10th in the world and finishes as high as third in the world in the open. I don't think anyone would have thought that at, at that time. And those, attributes, the physical attributes, the mental attributes, the psychological and emotional attributes, the movement attributes are all things that can be learned. And yes, we all have ceilings and not everybody can be everything. And you can't just, you know, say if you believe it, you're going to attain it because it's not really true. However, I think a lot of people pre make excuses so they don't even have to try. And I think that's a really damaging way of thinking. Um, And It's cool to see somebody that is literally one of the best business people of, you know, our generation of our time talking about not having anything that is a special talent that made him get to that level. And instead he had to learn what was required. And I think that's true for all of us in athletics, business, or whatever discipline that you want to have. Next, humility. 
So that's the principle that he's discussing, but it's not part of the sentence. Humility. Arrogance is one of the most destructive traits in an organization. It hurts productivity by having people to be oblivious to their own limitations and the contribution of others. Then he goes farther to say, having humility means understanding and accepting yourself as you really are. It means admitting your mistakes and what you don't know rather than being defensive and blaming others. This is something that I've tried to cultivate as a personality trait for as long as I can remember. Um, I know my own arrogance gets in my way all the time where I think like, oh, I can get this accomplished, I can do this, and then you realize I can't do this by myself, or you try and you fail, and it's just a shitty feeling, and had I just been a little bit more humble and asked for help earlier, I probably wouldn't have made a ton of the mistakes that I've made in the past. And I think in training, people want other people to believe they are a certain thing. And they try to hold them to the standard of what they want people to believe them to instead of just accepting that they're not at that standard yet and working towards it. And being humble enough to accept that you are where you are and it's going to require work to get where you want to go is one of the most important things that I've found for developing, helping people develop themselves into successful athletes or people or business people in general. The challenge is to get beyond the superficial stage in which employees understand the words and concepts but haven't yet been able to effectively imply them. Promoting those who cannot walk the talk undermines our ability to create value and damages the culture. So this has something to do with a, a staff meeting that I had a couple months back is I told our coaches that there are a couple things that determine what a quote unquote good coaches. One, it's being able to consistently and repeatedly help people improve at their training goals. Two, it's being able to convince other people that you are in fact a good coach and have them say out loud that you're a good coach. And three, that it's doing all of the things that are required to be a good coach. Constantly learning, having your ideas challenged, putting your ideas out there and having them challenged. And I have found that I told them I won't call myself a good coach until I can continually put people in the podium of the sports that they want to play. I can continually teach people uh, the concepts and how to apply them for their athletes. And having that humility and pressure on myself to say, like, no matter what I've accomplished up to this date, I still won't call myself a good coach is something that I've wanted to develop in my culture so that we're all trying to continually improve and push ourselves to actually be better instead of getting that arrogant mind state where we just get lazy and just get comfortable in our ideas and our methods and our group thinking. So uh, that just kind of tied into my own belief system and something that made me feel like, okay, cool. If one of the best business people in the world says, this is how you create a culture and, uh, and, a culture that continues to succeed, then I got to be somewhere on the right track. So it's just kind of like a, a feel good quote for me. Gardner's theory postulates that there are eight different kinds of intelligence and none of us is equally gifted or deficient in all of them. These are intrapersonal, intrapersonal, linguistic, logical, mathematical, spatial, naturalist, bodily, and musical. Uh, I find a lot of people in the world of fitness, uh, they throw out the term smart all the time, uh, referencing people that read books all the time, referencing people that can speak, referencing people that do biomechanical studies on movement. And I think it undermines people's self-confidence. And also in the physical culture, because so many physical people are what I would call in the multiple theory of intelligent bodily or you know kinesthetic learners or have high levels of kinesthetic development and maybe less than some of the other categories, A, they put way too much pressure on that singular aspect of themselves and B, they don't invest in the other aspects of themselves. And it's something as I've been building the community and when I have Corpus Animus on my logo is because I believe that body and mind are something that we should constantly invest in and that the 
development of any one thing. So if you want to develop your bodily intelligence, it also requires you developing the mental capacities and the mental constructs that are required to improve that so that these things are all interrelated and tied together. So that's something that I just wanted to throw out there. I know there's a lot of people probably watching these book thought books that aren't big readers and want to get takeaways from books and the work that I've done. And I always want to make sure that they know that they have a high degree of choices to make, to invest in themselves, to make themselves better. And if linguistics or reading is not one of their intelligences, that's okay. And they need to figure out where their competitive edges in the market and leverage that and connect with people that have other talents so that they don't have to feel deficient in their own uh, intellectual capacities. But be careful. Measures are only beneficial if they lead to profitable action. It is tempting to measure things simply because they are easy to measure. Instead, we need to measure things that matter even when it is difficult to do so. Not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts, Einstein observed. So this tied into training for me. Movement quality is something that I've found can't really be measured. And I know there's a lot of people out there in the market that are getting you know, front squat to back squat ratios or power clean to deadlift ratios and trying to have those as uh, quantifiable markers of, of structural balance or of quote unquote good movement. And I don't really think that that can be measured. It's something that can be observed. It's something that can be seen in somebody. It's something that you might be able to create certain proxies of, of improvement for, but I don't think it's something that can be measured, but it's definitely something that's important for long-term success and physical discipline. And something like training PRs, while they're important and while they're important for client retention, if somebody wants to be an athlete, they don't really count. It's how can you convert those training PRs to better performance on game day? And I think there are a lot of companies out there, a lot of people out there that have this desire to over obsess on training and forget that the any sport is not just about how you prepare for the sport, but how you actually play the sport when it matters. So getting people better at competing is a very, very difficult thing to, to measure and observe, but it's a very important thing that needs to be uh, a focus of any athlete's training plan. Another type of measurement that can help eliminate waste is benchmarking. The process of identifying, understanding, and adopting superior practices from anywhere in the world. We can all learn a great deal from the best in the company, the best in the industry, and the best in any industry in the world. That's just something that I've always believed. I think that you know humans as a species, our value and our survival skill is based on connecting to one another. And I think we've created a culture that is, is very segmented, very isolated. And while we're connected digitally, we don't really have authentic connections with people that could help us get better at the things that we want to get better at. And when we do and we create these companies or when we create families, we could seclude that and create, a, okay, this is us and everybody else is them type thinking. And in my business, I never wanted to do that. I, I try my best not to criticize other coaches out there or uh, make fun of their methods or say that they're stupid or say that they're not doing what I would do. And I constantly try to find what is this person, if they're more popular than I am or if they have people that are performing better than I ha have, what are they doing that I could take, internalize, and teach to my own community. So how can I bring other people's ideas into my business and basically steal their thought processes and their experience and try to upgrade them and take them in for myself. And it's one of the major reasons that I share my ideas is so that I can have them challenged by people that are out there and find people that are willing to challenge and willing to put their ideas out there and willing to connect with us and willing to try to help us get better. And I like to learn from other people and I think that should be something that all athletes, all business owners are really comfortable doing and not thinking that 
they have all the answers or creating a culture that is an echo chamber of ideas. So everyone is just constantly agreeing with one another and saying, oh, this is how it's done. You're so smart. This is so great. Uh, I don't think that ever led, leads or lends itself to long-term success and development. Following that up, the next quote is, a measure that is not considered benchmarking but can be can bring many of the same benefits is comparing actual performance to the ideal. So that one translated more to competing. So when I watch my athletes compete and I take notes and I sit down and I discuss with them how their how their competition went, a lot of times I'm looking at the workouts or I'm looking at even their training workouts and I'm saying if you could go back in time and re-perform this workout, what would you do differently? Look at, watch, do film review, and figure out how to crit criticize with your current training capacity whether or not you could have actually done better. Did you pace it incorrectly? Were there points of rest or, or breaks that you took that weren't necessary? And I feel like that balance between using that benchmarking against yourself and self-analyzing to get better is an important balance point away from going to competitions and measuring against everybody else and benchmarking yourself against the best in the world. So um, I just thought that was a good thing to add from a training perspective. At Coke, truth is what gets results is what stands the test of evidence and criticism, not what someone in the hierarchy declares is true. Continual questioning and brainstorming to find a better way is what we call challenging. It must be seen as an opportunity to learn and improve, not as a chance to kill another person's idea. Um, this is just something that I, I would strive for for my own company if my own coaches are listening to this. I want everybody to get challenged. I don't think I have the answers. I don't think Chris has the answers. I don't have, think Evan has the answers. I don't think Kyle has the answers. I don't think any one of the coaches, Brandon has the answers. Like none of us ever have the specific and definitive answer about how to do something most effectively. And by trying to cultivate a culture that's willing to look at an idea and say, could this be done better and then verbalize it is something that I think would create long-term success for any business. And I think that's true for athletes as well. If we coach you and you're part of our community and you think that something could be done more effectively for you specifically, that's something we want you to talk to your coach about so that we can continually work to find something that we think will help you succeed, but also you believe in, because belief is a very important part of long-term success. If you don't believe that something you're doing is going to get you better, the likelihood is it's not gonna make you better. So having that type of ability to challenge and question what you're doing and brainstorm and not just hold on and internalize that feeling of doubt is an important aspect of building a relationship and building a culture and building a, um, a path to success. Abraham Maslow taught, all human beings prefer meaningful work to meaningless work. The problem for management though, is how to set up social conditions in any organization so that the goals of the individuals match with the goals of the organization. He continues, this includes the need for meaningful work, for responsibility, for creativeness, for being fair and just, and just for doing what is worthwhile and for preferring to do it well. So this is obviously something that I wrote down specifically for my own culture. Uh, this ties into the thoughts that I had about business development before that people think of business as something that's so easily quantifiable. Are you making more money? Is your net revenue higher? Yes, that is an important aspect of business, but in order to establish a long-term business and in order to feel successful and meaningful in your own life, there are other things that go into what you're actually doing. And this, this quote ties into what I think about. I don't wanna be working all the time just to make money and think that that money is gonna give my life meaning. And for me to feel meaningful, I need to be able to uh, you know, talk shit with my coworkers and train with them and compete with them and go to competitions with people and try to create things and try to try new media strategies and all of that stuff, that challenge allows me to feel like I'm becoming a better person, I'm becoming a better business owner and that all of the struggles of life that I'm going through on a day-to-day -day basis have a purpose and have a reason and I want to be able to create that not just for myself but for all of our all of my own personal athletes, 
all the coaches that are here, all of our employees that are here, all of the athletes that are part of TTT, and anybody that could be consuming our media um, in general. Ludwig von Mises believed there are three requirements for humans to act. One, dissatisfaction with the present state of affairs. Two, a vision of a better state. And three, belief that we can reach that better state. When just one of these requirements is missing, people will not act. Um, I pulled this quote specifically because I get really sick of the constant uh, positivity that's put out in social media. Nobody's talking about how much failing sucks or how hard training actually is or going on really tough and regimented nutrition plans and how difficult that can be or how much it fucking sucks when your body is in pain and you don't feel confident to be able to move around and and do the things that you want to do on a regular basis. And everyone's trying to always say, be happy this, be happy that, motivate yourself to be happy. And I'm cool with that. Like I, I would like to be that happy. I would like to have that current state inside of me. But trying to live up to some false ideal of what happiness actually is, instead of putting happiness in a framework for what the human experience actually can allow it to be, I, I have found to be very damaging to not only my own psyche in the past, but the psyche of athletes in general. And I found this, number one specifically, the dissatisfaction with the present state of a affairs as something that is um, really indicative of what makes us make changes. And in the current market, there are people out there that are promoting, oh man, my life is so happy, so let me show you how to get that happy. And there is then this feeling of the people that are trusting them they have a dissatisfaction with where they are, so they're going to make changes, and they think that by getting from that state of dissatisfaction to where the guru or the person they look up to is, that that feeling and that that dissatisfaction will go away. But the truth is that at all stages of life, we probably all have some degree of dissatisfaction, and it is a necessary aspect of ourselves that allows us to move forward and to not just get stay stagnant and die. Life is about movement, not just like the training motion, but I mean literally if your heart stops working, you're dead. So you have to be motivated to get up and move and change and not be satisfied with every present moment. And those then those moments of satisfaction that you do get actually become meaningful. So I found that this is really good for people with regards to training that if you wanna get better at something, one of the first ways to actually make this first step to get better is admitting that your current state is not where you wanna be. And that's just okay to admit. That vulnerability and admitting it and finding help is not something that you need to be ashamed of because at, at some state in everybody's life, they're going to feel that. And if they haven't yet, or if they put up some sort of false mask that they're invulnerable and they're not ever going to feel those negative emotions, then life at some point is going to humble them. We don't ever go through life unscathed. There is always going to be challenges and setbacks and sadness and despair. And I think being honest about that is something that's helpful, not just for uh, the fitness community, but for business development and for um, I don't know, motivation in general. Not that I'm a motivator as a coach, but it's something that I have to talk to my athletes about all the time. Next quote. Einstein observed, failure is success in progress. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that an organization reward failure, although we should expect it on occasion. We should nevertheless strive to avoid it, in addition to learning from our failures, we must learn from the type of failure. We need to recognize whether a failure resulted from poorly thought out or impulsive action, or whether it belongs to that percentage of failures to be expected from prudent risk taking, such as well-designed experiments of bet. So this is our final quote, and it kind of ties into physical development for me more so than business. I think it is true that you'll launch products and they won't go well, or you know, you'll know you have a client that doesn't think you're a good coach, and there that will happen as well. But I didn't want to really talk about that. I wanted to talk more about training in general. 
And think about failure as something like showing up to a competition and doing worse one year than a previous year or uh, doing a specific exercise and getting injured. And I think there are a lot of people out there that will leverage that failure or look at that failure and try to point at somebody else and blame them. So as an example, if you're a coach, you write a workout, your athlete gets hurt, somebody else might look at it and say, oh, well, they got hurt because they didn't move well, you shouldn't have been doing this, as if they're their strategy for improving people physically will never put somebody into an injury risk position, which is completely untrue. And you, as a coach, look at that scenario and you look at it as a failure. Now, that is not necessarily beneficial for you to get better as a coach and prevent that situation from happening again. I think the best way to handle this as a coach or as a as a community of people that want to help other people get better at their physical um, performances or just improve their physical bodies in general is to understand the risks and reward of what you're actually doing and understand that failure is a part of the game. So if you want to improve someone physically, you want to get them stronger, you know that there's a certain level of injury risk that you're going to take. And based on the athlete and where they are and their training age and their demographic and appropriate assessment, you try to select the methods that make the most sense to reduce that injury risk as low as possible. But if you tell those people that, oh, you know, you'll only get hurt if you train stupid, then you're putting a very unrealistic pressure on yourself because you can't make that promise. And I think it's an important thing that we all as coaches, no matter how much knowledge you have about biomechanics, end range strength, the nervous system, proper training, proper hormones, proper nutrition, uh, you can't reduce that injury risk down to zero. And you can't, as a coach, tell an athlete, hey, I can guarantee that you're gonna do better next year because there are so many variables that go into that and largely as coaches or as people giving advice, we're not in control. So I try to set realistic expectations for my own culture, for my own community, for my athletes in general, for anybody that trusts me or for people that are watching this media that could potentially become involved with our organization that we are not perfect. And failure is something that is interwoven into our culture because it's something that we know A, will make us better and we know is interwoven into the fabric of being human itself. We are imperfect by nature. We can't predict the future and we can't make things happen no matter how much we work on them in the present moment. So. I thought that quote was a really great way to end and just say, hey, you know, failure is just part of the process.